Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Welcome to season four of Obsessed Show. You'll note that we are no longer calling it Obsessed with Design. This season, we'll still be chatting with designers from branding, illustration, architecture, and design thinking, but we'll also be talking to other makers and creatives along the way. In fact, when we started the show, the plan all along was to broaden out and talk to other guests eventually, which was part of why our website and Twitter handle and Instagram are all Obsessed Show. If you're into what we're doing here, you might also want to check out my personal branding and marketing tips called 59 Second Friday. That's over at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. That's enough about season four. Let's talk about today's episode. Okay, guys, today on Obsessed Show, I am chatting with Harag Nasanian. Harag is a Portland, Oregon based product designer, design director of performance based soft goods like bags and accessories. Harag cut his teeth with a little brand called Nike and just weeks ago launched his own brand called Wayfinder. We were connected on Instagram and I was instantly intrigued by the story of his brand launch and reached out to him to have him on the show. So without further ado, Harag, welcome to Obsessed Show. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate uh, you taking the time to, to speak with me. Yeah, so I was, um, as I alluded to, when we um, first connected on Instagram, it was kind of this this nebulous teaser campaign that you had going on. So talk us through what that was all about. Yes, yes. You know, uh, I found myself with uh, DMing many of my followers, letting them know that I'm not trying to be secretive or create intrigue. It's just that my product development took longer than I thought it would. I thought I thought it would be a slam dunk. You know, I've I've I have good relationships with manufacturers that I've known for many many years, uh, but yeah, it's you know some of it, some of them didn't pan out. You know, and and I tried making the products in uh, domestically in the U.S. And at first, the conversations were were very positive, and then crickets. And so then I went uh, over. <laughs> You know these companies, these these large contract, even small contract manufacturers. They, why do they want to work with someone that's just getting started? It's the same amount of effort that you would put into a small brand as as opposed to a big brand. You know, and with big brands, there's there's more uh, there's more revenue to be made, and uh, they're more established. So, so um, y- yeah, I mean, overall, it was hard to find the right manufacturer, and so. Um, so it took me a while to find that, and so, so I guess in a neg- from a negative point of view, it, it took me longer to get my product out there. But from a positive point of view, um, by the time I did launch, uh, there were more people. The audience was was bigger because um, it had been like a year and a half uh, since I launched my social media. So, so individuals such as yourself um, found themselves like, what is this? Like, I see some really cool inspirational images what's going on here? Like, what are they going to show me and when are they going to show it to me? So I think it worked to my advantage. And, and I think that, uh, that with future, future brand launches or product launches, um, I've learned that it's important to build your audience before you build your product, because you can make this amazing thing, but who's going to, who's going to buy it if no one knows about it. Right. So I want to dig in more to the story of Wayfinder um, but before I forget, we've got two exciting things, um, okay. and, and we don't get to do this all the time. So maybe you could share with our audience what our discount code is going to be. One, th- and of course, they don't even know what the product is yet, but we're going to talk all about that here in a second. So tell okay. them about the yeah. discount code. So uh, our website is wayfindercarry.com, and if they uh, type in the discount code Josh Miles fifteen. They will get 15% off their entire order. Well, that's very kind of you. And we're also going to do a giveaway at the very end of the show. So you got to listen to the end and we'll tell you what the giveaway is. Um, and of course, I want to talk more about Wayfinder. I'm a big fan yes. of minimalism. So that's a good a good awesome. hint. But um, maybe, you know, we, we've had a ton of graphic designers on the show. We've had a fair amount of digital and UI and web design. And um, we've had only a handful of product people. And especially with your background of working with Nike, um, 
I'm just really curious. Did you just like show up in Portland one day working for Nike or what, what was actually your designer origin story that got you to this place where you are now of launching your own brand? Right. Well, yeah, before, before I landed in Portland, you know, there was once a kid, he was probably like five years old, six years old, uh, that liked to draw a lot and, and didn't like things the way they were and wanted to make them different. And literally I was like five, six, seven years old, like using those fat pencils, you know, like they give the kids right. the fat pencils instead of the little ones because of their With your tongue sticking out of the side of your mouth. Exactly. It, you know, really focused, um, for dexterity, they used the bigger pencils, but, but, um, you know, that's when my design story started. Uh, I, I knew I, I didn't even know what it was called. I just knew that I wanted to kind of imagine things in a way that was different than how things already work. Um, and, and at that time it, I focused on cars maybe cause little boys like cars or something. Um, but, but I would draw other things like, and I would play with clay. I had this, like this oily clay that wouldn't dry out. Um, and I would make like little worlds and, you know, all kinds of things. So I was, I was very, uh, kind of creative in that sense growing up as a kid. And at some point I wanted to be a car designer. Um, because I want to make like shiny, cool stuff that people, people covet and, and love. Right. They um, use that clay stuff too. So <laughs> you're, totally. you're yeah. well on your way. Yes. And I, and I had taken, um, I had taken lots of classes. Uh, I was lucky, uh, to have grown up in a place where one of the best design schools exist and they had a, um, a, uh, a program for high school students. So I was a part of that program. Um, but when I went to community college, I was turned on to product design. And the difference with product design is, is you're creating products that enhance people's lives. You're solving problems and making products that improve the user experience. And that to me, like really stuck with me. And I I was like, wow, like, it's not just about making things that, that look pretty and are desirable, but can actually improve someone's life. And so that was kind of a turning point. And, uh, and so, yeah, I became a product designer and, um, um, my, my first role was, was working at a, a small consultancy in, in West, West, uh, Los Angeles near Santa Monica. And it was working on like commodity products, like CD wallets, you know, that just goes to show yeah. how long I've been the CDs don't really exist anymore. Right. Um, but that, that allowed me to kind of cut my teeth, uh, in what's called uh, soft goods, um, soft, you know, product design focused on, um, on soft sewn items. And, uh, so, so that was great. And, and then that consultancy was purchased by, uh, Targus, which is known for, um, kind of mobile computing laptop bags, things like that. And so, so we were kind of sucked into that, that machine. And, um, and then that was back in 2003 and, and that's when Nike was growing their, their global bags design department and and uh it was the perfect opportunity for me because i had already uh had some soft goods experience which at that time was not common it wasn't something that you could really learn in school um and so i think at that time there weren't very many designers that had that that uh that experience now like they're everywhere and i'm, I'm competing with soft goods designers um all around the world um, but it was a little different time then. And so, so that's how I ended up in Portland, um, at Nike, uh, back on, I think it was like a rainy day in October of 2003. Yes. <laughs> so, um, did Nike have the same, th- this is a little bit of a spoiler, but did Nike have the same philosophy for like minimalism and clean design as, as what you're embracing today with Wayfinder? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think that, that Nike is not. I, th- I think there is a minimal aspect to it, but I think more than that, there's like like creating products that really kind of get your attention, mm-hmm. that are polarizing. Like at first, you may not like it. You're, you see something, you're like, ah, oh, what is this? Like, and it's because you're seeing something that you haven't seen before. Like it hasn't registered. It's not. It's unfamiliar. And I think this happens with uh, automobiles. You know, you'll see a car, and at first, you're like, ah, oh, like. Like this is different. Like mm-hmm. before everything was doughy and now this is like sharp angular and, and different. And so, so I think that Nike is really good um, with their brand messaging, their advertising, 
and especially their products um, to create products that are polarizing. So, so I think that they can be, you know, in the minimal box, but I think that, that the bigger box that they're in is, um, is bold, Mm -hmm. bold, something that, that, that makes your pulse go up and, uh, and something that, that, that at first you're not sure, like, what is this? Like, is this something that, that I want? Is this something that I'm going to buy into? And, and then you just jump right in. So my background is largely, um, brand design on the graphic design side. Yes. Um, and something that I've told people for years and years and years is if you're launching a brand and at some point you don't feel a little bit nervous or a little bit of fear, a little bit scared that this is too different, then you're probably not pushing yourself far enough. And I'm sure that's probably true Ooh. with the product space as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Like, like, uh, every day I do something that, that, scares me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's good. So maybe, um, tell our listeners a little bit about, um, the story behind Wayfinder. What was the inspiration? You know, you're working for this amazing company in Nike sure. and sure. yet you left to hang up your own shingle and do something else. So my guess sure. is there's a big vision behind that, but, um, tell us about that inspiration. Sure. Yeah. The, the vision behind the brand is creating minimal modern products that that help you explore and shape your future. And what I mean by that is like, I'm making products that create a subtle shift in the user, a, a positive, a positive shift. So our first collection, they're, they're wallets and card holders and, and small accessories. And so, so by using the Wayfinder products, it helps you carry less because you're only, you're forced to carry only the most important things. And so I think that's a really good example of, of what of what Wayfinder is, and 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 that is how it's shown up in the first collection of, of accessories. But that will continue to evolve with with future collections. And and to me, like like um, I had an eye opening moment, um, or kind of like a wake up, like like you know, light bulb uh, kind of moment um, while I was at Nike. You know, like like how can like I. I, I I asked this question and, you know, at Nike, you work with lots of athletes from, from like high school to elite number one in the world athletes. And, and a question that, that I would ask is, can a bag help you perform better? Like, let's, mm -hmm. let's say basketball, like can a bag help you be a more consistent shooter, better dribbler? You know, I don't know. I'm not a basketball player. And at first I thought the answer would be no. Like, like how can a bag that's not even used on court, um, improve um, an elite athlete, a world-class athlete's performance on court. And it, at first, I thought for sure, no. Like, how could they even be connected? And and the answer that I got was a resounding yes. And the reason that I got was, if there's a place for everything that I carry in my bag, then I take my mind off of that. I take my mind off of that and I can focus on the game, which is, which mm. is important. Or I can focus on my dribbling or my shooting or whatever that is. And so, so that was like a very powerful moment for me because at that point I realized that, that as a designer, I can actually create products that help shape and change the behavior of the consumer. And so that was like the big nugget that I discovered and I, and I've put into Wayfinder. So just from um, what I've gathered from looking at your website and the initial product suite that you're launching with, it seems like a lot of it is focused on slimming down kind of the smaller elements that you might travel with. Is is travel kind of a part of that inspiration for you? Yeah, absolutely. I think travel is a big part of it, especially with the, the three styles. Well, there's four styles. There's a notebook too, but um, the style that's definitely geared towards travel the most is the the Daybreaker uh, billfold wallet. And it's a wallet that carries a boarding pass and it carries currency from around the world. And And the need for this product came out of, of my needs. Um, I travel with my family um, and we use we use miles to, that we rack up the whole year and we, and we buy, uh, you know, like plane tickets to go to Europe in the summertime. And uh, my daughter is eight, soon, soon she'll be nine. Like she's not carrying her boarding pass. and. Hmm. And when you buy a ticket with miles, like unless you have a lot of miles then you can like fly business class, but we're, we're flying squirrel class or coach class. And there's usually a few layovers. And, and so there's all these boarding passes, like for international flights, you can't put that on your, you know, you can't put that on your phone. And, 
and uh, just, you know, swipe or scan that, you know. So I have all these boarding passes. Like, there, you know, for the three of us, there could be, you know, two, four, six. There could be like, there could be like 12 boarding passes. And so, like, where do these go, you know, especially when you're like jet lagged? And so the wallet came out of that need. And then also, many people that I that I know, and, and it's it's been me in the past, where you may travel to different countries for work and you find yourself with Japanese yen in your pocket, Chinese renminbi in your pocket, US dollars, euros. So like, how do you manage all that? And so I hadn't seen a product like this. I haven't seen a product like this in the marketplace. And so that's why I created the borderless uh, global uh, billfold wallet. And, and so it's definitely geared towards travel. Um, so it carries all this stuff, but yet it's still really minimal. Like if it's not, if it's, if it's uh, here, I have one right here. Um, it's, it's super thin when you don't have anything in it. And, and yet it, it holds, you know, it holds a, a boarding pass. You know, this one says, <laughs> you must be coming to wild. see you. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, it's really minimal. And then, and then the passport holder, um, is kind of a nice to have, you know, like all, like to me, it's like, it's like when you have a product like a passport holder, it means like you've arrived. Like it's something that you don't need, but it's nice to have, you know, like, and like they put all these like little stickers. I hate it when they put stickers, like when you go international, like you've already gone through security, but then someone checks to make sure that you're, that you're at the right flight and your bags are checked. So I put a little sticker on it. And then those things get stuck on your passport and, and they get all gummy and stuff. And I hate that. So like if they put a sticker on this, like it, it comes, it comes right off. Um, but, but also when you're not, when you're not traveling, um, the passport holder, um, you can put a notebook in there. And so, so I've actually made a notebook that fits in there. And as a designer, like when you like, especially when I worked in the corporate world, like there's a meeting every few hours, like in an eight hour day, you're in probably three meetings. Like you, know, you go to a meeting, maybe you have time to go to your desk then you go to another meeting. And mm -hmm. so you're always carrying around something like this or actually something like, like this, right. You know, to take notes and, so I've always wanted to have like a smaller notebook. And so, so this size notebook is great because, because you pop it in the passport holder and it goes in your front pocket. And so, so you can be minimal, um, at work. Love it. So maybe, um, again, a lot of our listeners, I'm sure are from the graphic design space or illustration or brand or yes. web, um, but you know, the whole point of this show of obsessed show is finding inspiration from some of the most creative people in the world and understanding the ways in which they work and how, even though maybe I make video or I do photography, you know, understanding how a product designer might handle their day. So what does that look like for you? What's, what's a typical sure. work day or workflow? What's, what's your process? Just kind of talk me through some sure. of that. Sure. Well, well, when I worked in the corporate world, there was, there was, it was very structured and there's a calendar and, and you, you go through that process. And most of, most of what I did was design. Right. But, uh, but, uh, now, uh, on my own as a, as a design consultant, I do consult for, uh, for other companies around the world, um, as well as Wayfinder. It's different every day. Every day I come into the office and it's different. I usually have a to-do list of, of like my top priorities. And those are the things that I'm going to get after first, but, but, um, but it moves in phases. So, so like at one time I may be focused solely on design and then when that's completed, then I'll move into, into development, uh, sourcing. If, if I'm working on a new product, like, like for this, uh, this notebook, like I wasn't familiar with, you know, um, vendors that made notebooks. So then it's like drop everything and, and just like kill as many brain cells, you know, finding, finding vendors, uh, for that can, that can make the, the notebook. And so, so it changes. And when that changes, it's like, it's like all hands on deck, like these hands, like it's just me, um, where I just like focus 100% on, on that thing to like, kind of push that through. Like we pushed it through design, we pushed it through development. Now we have to figure out freight forwarding and, and, and the logistics of how it's going to get to where it's supposed to be. Um, and then it's packaging, right? So, so there's, it's just like a step-by-step -step process. And, and uh, that's really it. And as a designer, like I'm working on bringing my creativity to each step of that, that process. Like, how can I do this differently? Like, even if it's like batching, like, like creating a new email address so that, so that all the vendors that I communicate with, it all goes into that because otherwise it's just like, it's just becomes chaotic. So, so I think that every day is different, but I strive really hard to bring that creative process um, 
to kind of have like efficiencies um, of scale um, built in, built into whatever I'm doing. So, what percent of your work week uh, currently is is still um, kind of the the consulting piece? So, things that are not Wayfinder, not your own brand. Yeah, I would say right now it's it's thirty percent consulting, seventy percent Wayfinder. Cool. Is that a big shift from uh, from a few months ago, or has it been pretty it's, consistent? It, it, it is a big shift from a few months ago. Uh, a few months ago, it was probably forty uh, percent uh, consulting, sixty percent. Uh, my brand, and then and then maybe six or seven or or a year ago, it was eighty percent consulting and twenty percent my brand. So um, it's definitely shifted, and and now I'm not uh, seeking out consulting opportunities as aggressively as I have been, say, six months ago or a year ago. So I'm curious about your um, your brand launch itself, and kind of yes. what you've learned along the way. And I know you talked a little bit at the top of the show about. Um, that it just took longer than you thought to source things. And even yes. though you had experience in that, you still hit some bumps, but yes. what else have you yeah. learned in the launch? I've learned so much and I'm still learning a lot, but, um, so I thought everything was going to be amazing. I thought, I thought like I've built up a strong following on social media of uh, a little over 5,000 followers. Um, people that would send me DMS like, Oh, when is your product going to launch? Can you, can you show me some pictures? Like, I'm like, wow, it's great. Like, like, if I have like a thousand messages like this and 500 of them buy it half, then that's great. You know, right out of the gate, you know, and then I had a pretty strong, I have, uh, I thought I had a pretty strong mailing list of over 300 uh, subscribers that were signed up for updates and promotions um, early on. And, and from, from speaking with other founders, they're like, Oh, when I, when I launched, I had 50, I had 49, 49 um, subscribers and I had no mm -hmm. following on the media. And so I'm like, great, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing really well. But, um, but when the website went live, like, like there weren't sales just like pouring in and, and yeah. even now it's been like almost a month and, and it, and, and it's steadily increasing, the engagement's increasing, the sales are increasing. So it, everything is moving in the positive direction, but, but it was kind of eye opening to me that, uh, that like, I thought like after launch, I was going to like, you know, like be like, all right, great. You know, now I just fulfill orders and I can start the, the second collection and yeah. the third collection. I can go back to design. You know, I love design, so I can go back to that. But instead it was like, you know, it was like rolling up my sleeves to, to like become a marketing machine and, you know, to get on, on, on your show as an example and, and to figure out, you know, what can I do to get the brand out there? Because, because in order for me to get sales like this, I have to really, increase the number of people that know about my brand. So from a, from a marketing standpoint, is most of what you're doing organic? Are you developing like channel partnerships? Have you tried paid social and like, just talk through some of the marketing elements? Sure. So, so up until now it's been, I would say 95% organic. And I think that I would like to keep it organic, um, for the, for the time being, um, probably for the next six months to, a year at least. I have dabbled a little bit with um, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, uh, Pinterest ads, and um, the engagement has been high, but the click-through sales have been low. So, mm. so yeah, it, it, it hasn't been effective. And, and speaking with other founders um, who are like one step, two steps, three steps ahead of me, um, they're advising me to, to also like focus on the organic stuff. And they're like, yeah, you know, like, if you want to win with, with, uh, the paid, paid advertising, like you have to be in it for the long haul and just, you know, just put ads out there, um, for a long time. And so, so my focus will be organic search, focusing on influencers, um, getting product out there. So, um, but even that's tricky. Like I've, I've sent out some products, um, there was a professional mountain biker that I had sent out products to, uh, who has maybe over 200,000 followers and uh, he posted a, he posted about wayfinder and um, it didn't move the needle nothing happened mm -hmm. you know and and like uh you know the products are good for are great for travel but they're also great for uh for people that are they're doing kind of action sports where they may be carrying a card holder or a wallet on them like such as cycling um mountain biking and so i thought that would be a very a very kind of um obvious, obvious opportunity, but, but yeah, I, I didn't get, 
I didn't get any 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 traction from that. So so yeah, it's tricky, and I'm still figuring that out. I enjoyed um, checking out your launch videos because those you can kind of get the feel for the product itself, and you see a little yes. bit of the manufacturing process. Yes. Um, and I love the quote. I think it was in the second video that was about yes. um, design as the art of sort of how little you can do. Or um, you want to talk about that concept a little bit? Uh, yeah. I. I um, yes. I don't know the exact quote, but but actually, if it is the same quote that we're talking about, and, and maybe I have to pull up another screen. I think it may have been um, a Leonardo da Vinci quote. Like it was a adaptation of yeah. a Leonardo da Vinci quote, but like, like, um, like the hardest, maybe I don't exactly know, but maybe the hardest thing to do uh, are the things that are simple. Like, um, but is that kind of, is that kind of what you're, or, yeah, or you're it was with? just a, just a cool take on, on minimalism. I should have written it down yes. verbatim. So, so you and I both didn't have to remember your script from the yeah, video. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's all right, but but yeah, like for like for the brand, it's it's um, it's in, like like simplicity is important. There's beauty in simplicity, and it's not easy. It's not. It looks easy, like oh, it's just this, but to execute something that's simple is actually quite complex. Um, but it feels so good from the perspective of a consumer. It feels so good to experience a product that's done well and is simple. And, and in one of those videos, and maybe both of the videos, um, I talk about uh, avoiding and reducing visual fatigue because I think that products, especially in today's day and age, they can be loaded with features. And, and, and most of those features aren't necessary. They're, mm -hmm. You're not gonna miss them if they're not there. You don't, you don't need them. You know, 90% of the time you're using a wallet for, for just carrying cash and cards like do you really need to have a little like a little like a one of those little pin things that releases the sim card on your on your uh, on your phone or or like rfid protection like that's like it's it's bogus like there's no claims for people whose whose uh, information has been compromised so just like really focusing in on the main things that make a product great if it's a card holder it should hold cards if it's a wallet it should hold you know your pass, your uh, your boarding pass, and, and your currency. Um, so so that's been my focus, like to to do some simplicity really well. So I know you said that you're kind of a one man band at this point, and I'm curious, kind of between all the the product photography and the video, I see kind of your little your little setup in the back there with some lights. So yes. are you doing all of that stuff yourself as well, all the shooting and? No, no, I, I rely on experts. Um, if I can do something at a, at a very competent level, I'll do it myself. And I am a, a one man show and, and I do, I do lots of things that, that down the road, someone else will do, but, but, um, I rely on, on super talented people for photography, video, video editing, um, uh, like the, gra some graphic elements, like my brand. Um, I work, I, provided the art direction to someone that was very talented and, and they were able to execute on that. Um, so I, I still contribute the, the creative, the creative part. Um, but I leave it to the experts. Cool. So this is a variation on a question that I ask a lot of our guests, which is, um, you know, I like to ask our guests, it's not all perfect, right? We hit rough spots. We have red flags or things that go sideways. I'm curious, especially in the product world or specifically in this launch, were there products that were originally going to be part of this collection that you nixed for some reason in the process due to price or it just wasn't working for you or anything? Yeah. Um, just kind of talk through that piece of it. Sure. Yeah. That's a really good question. Yeah. There are, there, there was a larger collection. I think three is a great number. I love odd numbers, uh, you know, three, five, seven. Um, but I started out with a much larger collection. And when I ran into issues with manufacturers, um, that were having a hard time committing to working with me. Um, when I switched from one manufacturer to another, some of those styles kind of fell off. And I said, you know, like it's hard enough for me to find the right manufacturing partner. Let me just focus on these three styles so I can get this right with this manufacturer. And once that's done, then I can worry about all the other, um, all the other products. And, and I'm sure, you know, there's a lot out there about the MVP minimal viable product and, and maybe some people would say, Hey, you should have launched with, with just one instead of three. Um, so 
I, I think for me, uh, this collection of, of three um, is my MVP. But but yeah, there's there's other other products that were in the works that are that are on hold and have been developed probably like 50% there. Um, but but now that everything is established, it's going to take a lot less effort. Mm-hmm. So if I, I decide to activate those, now the materials are set up, the manufacturer is set up, they know what I want and how I work. And so now it's just a matter of like, all right, here, like let's let's take this and and finish the last 50% or the last 30% to get this over the top. What is that material that you're using for these products? Uh, that's a good question. It's a it's a uh, polymer coated polyester, and polymer mm. is another word for for uh, rubber, or it's not rubber. It's actually it's like a it's a elastomeric um, plastic, um, technically TPU thermo polymer urethane thermoplastic urethane something like this but it's a non-vulcanized um rubber and uh when this material um is combined and then there's a machine called an rf welder radio frequency welder there's two pieces of metal that go on opposite opposite sides of the material and then they vibrate at thirty thousand times a second and Mm -hmm. when they vibrate thirty thousand times a second it creates focused heat in that one little area and it bonds the two materials together um, for a super, super strong bond that will never come apart. Like those two materials become one. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. And it's, uh, it's PVC free. PVC is, is, uh, looks, can look like, um, polyvinyl chloride it can look like TPU. Um, but it's a car, it's a known carcinogen. It off gases mm. it for the environment. Um, so this is TPU, uh, technically it's a, it's a, uh, it's a polyester resin, I think. And technically, the entire product can be recycled um, if you find the right, the right facility because the core material is polyester and the, co- the coating is TPU. So, so technically, it's not bad for the environment and it can be 100% recycled um, if you were able to find the right facility. So for all of our listeners with a strong physics and chemistry background, I hope that was an <laughs> interesting lesson. I just thought it looked really cool and I couldn't tell what it was. Yeah, um, I, don't, you know, I, don't focus, I don't focus on that because you know, people's eyes glaze over. Right. But yeah, but it, yeah, I just focus on, it's really cool. And this is, these are the properties. Yeah. And the material matters though. It's the, all about the, the touch and the look sure. and it adds to that totally. minimal look Absolutely. for it. Yes. And that's, uh, I assume how you get away without the, all the other stitching and gluing and, and all that, because we've got, yes. you know, laser beams coming from space to vibrate and make this stuff stick together. <laughs> I think Absolutely. that's what you said. <laughs> Yes, that's exa- that's exactly what I said. Yeah, and that just yeah, yeah, it it allows to make a more visually simple product without painted edges and bonding and skiving of leather and 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 a lot of people are opposed to you know animal products, animal components in their products. So so this makes it vegan, vegan friendly, or it's it's not. There's no leather. Cool. So um, do you want to tease us with what's next for Wayfinder? What's the next product we should be on the lookout for? <laughs> sure. I mean, I, I can, I'll be honest. Like I, I, I don't know. I have to figure that out. Like I, I, there are some things that are in the works. Um, but I'd really like to see how the next six to 12 months goes and the feedback that I get from consumers, from, from potential retailers, because I think that will help guide me in the direction that I need to go because I have, I may have an idea and I do have some ideas, uh, for, for slings, uh, for, for kind of crossbody things that, that you can put like your cam- camera in, lenses, um, kind of focused for for travel, for Instagram bloggers, um, that's weather resistant. Um, so I, I think that that is, is something that's really interesting. Um, but but I don't know, I, I think it needs to be validated and, and I'll get that validation um, through the consumers that, that are learning about Wayfinder now, um, as well as retailers that, that I end up working with. Do you have any um, design heroes in the product design, or doesn't even necessarily have to be soft goods, sure. but other either, you know, individual designers or brands that you look up to? Sure. Yeah, I, I really like this German designer Stefan Diaz. I don't know if I'm saying his name the right way, but I followed his work for maybe at least 15, 15, 16 years. And what I like about his work uh, is he has a really good understanding of the materials and and how those materials can be fabricated. Like, and that to me is like, is really important. And I strive to be a designer who can, you know, like 
like you have you have this material and these are the things that you can do with it. So what's the most creative way that you can you can use this material um, knowing the manufacturing capabilities and the limitations of this material. And and he does that really well. And a lot of the work that he's done uh, is furniture. Uh, he's worked on bags um, many years ago. And I, I'm just continu continually um, intrigued and um, and just enamored by his work. Cool. Um, so question that I ask everybody who's ever been on the show yes. is um, we find that us designers, <laughs> we're an obsessed lot. Yes. So I'm curious what you find, and it could be anything under the sun, but, but what do you find that you are most obsessed with right now? Uh, I, I obsess the details. I like, I mean, around my brand, I, I obsess all the little details. Like everything is important. Like when someone receives like the item, the items that they've ordered and they trip out at the packaging or whatever, I just let, let them know. I say, you know, I take this stuff very seriously. Like the consumer experience, like I don't have a retail store. Like you can't walk, walk into, you know, your downtown area and, find a Wayfinder store. The way that you experience the brand is through my social media, the website, and ultimately um, from our package that you get in the mail. Mm -hmm. And so that unboxing experience, the packaging experience is super, super, super important for me. And so, so really like sweating the details and thinking of things that, that other people wouldn't think about. Like the, the boarding pass that I showed you earlier, um, this is a real boarding pass that I print myself. And every order uh, comes with one of these with with uh, the person's name on it. And it has a little QR code that you can put your phone up against and, and scan it. And it'll give you uh, a discount code for a future purchase. And, and so, you know, this ties directly to travel, which is a big part of the brand. And so it's totally unexpected. And, and last week I was an outdoor retailer, which is a trade show for kind of the outdoor industry. There's mm -hmm. lots of... Uh, vendors that are making, you know, materials, trims, zippers, whatever. And so I meet with all those people and I meet with brands to, to get more consulting work. But, but I had a bunch of these that I made up um, with a special promo code for outdoor retailer. And I was passing these things out like candy, right. With everyone that I meet and, and people were just, they were like, what, what is this? Like, and then some people thought like, Oh, uh, uh, did you mean to give me your business card? Cause I think you just gave me your boarding pass. And I would say, I would say, no, this is for you to get on board with a 25% discount for my brand, you know? And so, so the details, I like to sweat yeah. the details and, and that transcends to everything. And, and, and maybe it's to a fault, you know, like it could be a problem because it really could slow you down. But, um, yeah, does that kind of answer? Yeah, absolutely. I had a, uh, an art director that I worked with. Um, right out of school and he used to call that um, painting the inside of the mailbox like the, Bingo. On, the only guys that are going to see that are the ones who open the mailbox and look inside but when they look inside they're going to go yep they painted the inside of the mailbox love it that's that's exactly it yeah those things are really important the things that you don't see are just as important as the things that you do see it's i mean it's so important they're equally important there's no there's no hierarchy one from the other it doesn't matter if no one will see it it's there yeah. You know? And when you think of things that you get in the mail too, I mean, this is a little more common now, but you know, having branded packing tape and then you open the box and it's, yes. it's your box, not just a box. And then you open up and yes. the tissue paper is branded and the box is nice and, and the enclosures are nice. And there's a nice little message on the inside of the box and just everything you interact with. I just love that approach. Yes. And, and for me, it's, it's not just sweating the details for the sake of sweating the details every detail is an opportunity for me to tell my story. And so this could just as easily have been on a little three by five card or a business card that says, Hey, thank you for your purchase. Here's mm -hmm. a discount code for next time. You know, but that doesn't have the impact of this and this has an impact and it relates directly to the story of Wayfinder. And so, so I, I just want to focus that, that it's not just sweating the details, but, but it's using the details to, to further enhance storytelling. Do you have any um, dream projects, either a product you want to release for Wayfinder or, you know, something you'd like to consult on in the future? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have anything specific. I'm, I'm intrigued by architecture, which is not bags and it's not accessories, but I'm really intrigued by architecture and I'd love to be able to 
build a structure from the ground up and and kind of focus on materials uh, just like i'd mentioned the, the german designer that uh, has a really good grasp of materials and their capabilities um, but to be able to, to build a structure like a beautifully modern simple refined structure and re really play with materials and push the boundaries of those materials in a way that, that maybe has, hasn't been done before. Um, but that that really is something that I think about, like I wanna build like this mountain cabin or a beach cabin or something like mm -hmm. this, and it's like this. So those are kind of the deep, the, the dream projects. Um, will I ever get to do it? I, I don't know, but it's something that, that gets me excited. So um, maybe on the opposite side of excitement, I yes. know um, other types of design, we, we look at things that are maybe popular or common issues or challenges, problems in the marketplace. Is there anything that you see that other product designers or brands do that just kind of drives you crazy? Like, like why do they still do this or why, why is this showing up? Is there anything that kind of yeah, sets you totally. off? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. And I, and I feel like this, this complaint that I have, I may be the, um, I may not be the majority with this, you know, like this may not be the popular majority opinion, but the things that really drive me crazy are when I see products out there that are like Swiss army knives, not like literal Swiss army knives, but they're products like a hoodie that, excuse me, that has, that has like a pocket for this and it comes with a battery or, you know, or it's a backpack that, that comes with all these different things, you know, or like so much like hyper organization that you have mm -hmm. this empty bag that just weighs a ton because it just has all this stuff. And, you know, it's, it's the, it's the jack of all trade, but master of none. And, and so I just, I, I, I dislike products that are this way that just have like just feature creep. They have, it's like the VCR from the eighties. It's like, just because you have this like circuit board where you can put all these like features on, like you can put an alarm and you can put a timer. Like doesn't mean that you should have it. It just it, mm -hmm. uh, a VCR, like you know, play, record, rewind, eject. You know, that's it. And then have the time, maybe, so you could see it. And and so I think today, like a lot of products are are in that in that realm of just, you know, if more is more, more is better. And 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 I think the opposite. So that's what bothers me. You know, for those of us, um, for those of our listeners who were not around in the eighties. There was not a VCR on the planet that wasn't blinking 12 because totally. nobody knew yeah. how to do all the things. I mean, the, the simple function of just setting the time on the VCR was uh, borderline impossible for most of these brands. And, and I think that's a great example. Um, what's your favorite piece of advice, either your favorite piece of advice to share with others or maybe a favorite piece of advice that you've received from a design perspective? Yeah, I, I think I would say go for it. That would, that would be it. Like, like in my, in my career, when I worked in the corporate world, um, I was chicken shit. I don't know if, if I could say that, but, but I was scared at a time when, when like I had like finance, like my financial resources were incredible. The benefits like vacation time, like everything, like I was, my cup was full with all these things. That was the time when I should have been the most fearless to go for it and try things, you know, whether it's like, you know, at night on the side or whatever. And, and I, did, I didn't do it. And, and that's on me. And so, so it took me a, a long time to, you know, I've been thinking about doing things, but it took me a long time to actually do it. And so that would be the biggest advice that I would give to someone else. Like for me, it was like ready, aim, ready, aim, ready, aim, but there was no fire. And mm -hmm. so, so now like every day it's just fire, 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 you know, and, and that's what I would encourage, you know, your viewers. And this is, this is what now I, I live on is like, just go for it. You know, worry about whatever later. And, you know, like it's just the op whatever the opposite of fear is, you know, it's, it's like the things that kept me up um, a year ago where I'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning, like they don't phase me today. I just like make a note of it so that it's there. I don't, I don't forget it. And then I'll refer back to it later, but it doesn't, it doesn't scare me. So I would say, if you're thinking about something, go for it. Love it. Well, hey, before I have you um, share all the places that our listeners can track you down online and um, and and purchase some Wayfinder goods for themselves, let's talk more about that um, promo again. 
Um, again, if you enter, what do we say? Josh miles 15 is our promo code over at yes. wayfindercarry.com. Um, That's and, and here's our giveaway guys. So if you head over to the Instagram and you follow at wayfinder carry and you, um, or so make a follow and make a post and say something about obsessed show. And then we'll, we'll pick you out of the the ether on the interwebs, uh, you'll be entered for a drawing. So we'll figure out how this works between the, I'm sure hundreds of thousands of entries we're going to get. <laughs> Can't wait. Sounds great. So again, go to Instagram, follow at Wayfinder carry, mention something about Wayfinder and obsessed show on Instagram. And we will, you will be entered to win something fabulous. So, uh, before we let you go, um, tell our listeners where else they can, connect with you, track you down and, and find all the Wayfinder goods. Sure. Yeah. The best place to connect with the brand is on Instagram, Wayfinder carry or at Wayfinder carry. And then our, our website for, for purchasing, uh, purchasing our products and learning more about the brand is wayfindercarry.com. And then what about you personally? What about me personally? What, where, what? where can our listeners connect with you online? Uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, so my website is harag.net, H R A G.net. Um, that's just, um, where I have samples of previous work that I've done and there's a contact page, uh, they can contact me there and, uh, you can learn more about kind of my background and that also has social links to all my personal like LinkedIn, whatever that, that sort of stuff. Perfect. Well, Harag, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today and thank you yes. for being obsessed with design. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Josh. I really appreciate it. Okay, kids, that's show number 123 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. As we expand our topics here at Obsessed Show, please tweet at Obsessed Show and let me know who else you think we should talk to. Do you want to hear from video people, from authors, from painters? What kind of creators and creatives and makers are most interesting to you? Because that's who I want to interview on this show. Don't forget to check out that new 59 Second Friday series all about personal branding and marketing on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash Josh Miles. And it would mean a lot to me if you just hit that subscribe button. Every subscriber means a lot. You can get all of today's show notes on our website, still at obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show from the power of minimalism at Miles Herndon, a branding agency in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. Visit milesherndon.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.